Bonners College to welcome you to tonight's Bonner and Bonner Lecture Series, Civic Leadership for the Common Good. This is a momentous night for two reasons. First, this lecture series, this traditional lecture series is so important to this campus. And the second thing is, is this is the first time that a new tradition starts of the University Honors College sponsoring uh, and organizing this event. And we are absolutely delighted to do so. As many of you know, the Honors College theme is civic leadership for the common good. Uh, we are very motivated to help uh, do everything we can to help uh, enhance the communities in this area and uh, to teach our students civic leadership skills. We want everybody to know that academic excellence is about service to the common good. So tonight, the Bonner and Bonner Lecture Series uh, continues. And just a little bit of history here. This lecture series was established in 1992 by Drs. Thomas and Mary Bonner, ESU's first and second African American faculty members. And uh, due to uh, our, uh, our speaker tonight, a distinguished mathematician, it's, it's uh, important to note that Dr. Tom Bonner was, 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 uh, was a mathematician himself, so this really does fit tonight. The series provides a valuable window to diversity, promoting tolerance and understanding on campus, in the community, and throughout the state. In, in 2015, the Honors College, with its focus on civic leadership and the common good, assumed the responsibility for sponsoring this landmark event. Consistent with the tradition of the lecture, the series promotes diversity and inclusion, but it adds now the role of civic leadership in making progress on challenges facing our communities, and that emphasis will be included as well in each, in, in each series of uh, speech from this point on. But we're delighted to have you with us, Dr. Robowski. Thank you so much for coming. This is a truly remarkable man. Uh, he spent, as a 12-year-old, uh, five nights in jail. Uh, jailed uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, for participating with others in the civil rights marches of the day. He knew Dr. Martin Luther King, he knew Fred Shuttlesworth, and from those beginnings, he has gone on to become a renowned educator and uh, done a great deal to help make the world a better place. Dr. Freeman A. Rabowski III, President of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, since 1992, is a consultant on science and math education to national agencies universities, and school systems. He was named by President Obama to chair the newly created President's Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence for African Americans. He also chaired the National Academies Committee that produced the report, Expanding Underrepresentative Minority Participation, America's Science and Technology Talent at the Crossroads in 2011. Named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine in 2012. Wow. And one of America's best leaders by US News and World Reports in 2008, he has received the TIAA Crafts Theodore M. Helsberg Award for Leadership Excellence in 2011, the Carnegie Corporation's Academic Leadership Award, and the Heinz Award for Contributions to Improving the Human Condition. The University of Maryland of Baltimore County has been recognized as a model for inclusion for inclusive excellence by such publications as U.S. News, which the past seven years has recognized UMBC as a national leader in academic innovation and undergraduate teaching. Uh, so tonight we have a, 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 the great honor of welcoming to our campus Dr. <coughs> Freeman A. Rabowski III and his remarks, Rethinking Education in America, a 50-year perspective. We are so glad to have you here. Welcome. Do we have in the audience? 
Let me see that. Good. How many of you know what you want to do? Uh, <laughs> I begin with poetry. Uh, people are always surprised that as a mathematician, I start with poetry. It was William Carlos Williams who said, it's difficult to find news in poetry, and yet men die miserably every day because of a lack of what is found there. And I start with words from the late Maya Angelou, who spoke to this country at the installation of President William Clinton, surprisingly before many of you were born. And she said, lift up your eyes upon this day breaking for you. Give birth again to the dream. Women, children, men, take it, this dream, into the palms of your hands. Mold it into the image of your most private self. Sculpt it into the shape of your most public need. Here on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face and say simply, very simply with her. She said, good morning, and I'm going to say good evening to all of you. Good evening. Give poetry a round of applause. Because it is My message tonight is that the way we think about ourselves as a society, as a university, as individuals, the language that we use, the way we interact with each other as students, as colleagues, will shape not only who we are today, but who we will be in the future. That our dreams and our values really do become who we are on our way to becoming. Students, the president of Stanford asked other college presidents in the past year the question, how long do you think college students can listen to a lecture before they fade out? What do you think the answer was? An hour. An hour. Do you really think that? <laughs> Somebody else? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? If you can. It depends. Yeah. You're trying to say whether or not I'm interested in that. I get it. Um, <laughs> I got that. Okay. Yeah. Half an hour. Anyone else? It's about eight minutes, colleagues. About eight minutes. Now, what do the neuroscientists say? How long do you think faculty members can focus and listen to a lecture? <laughs> There's a huge variation even among faculty up here. Well, the, the neuroscientists would say typically 20 minutes. That we can focus for about 20 minutes and then we fade, we may come back to it. Why do I tell you that? Much of what we're learning about education suggests that we need approaches to discussions, to lectures, that will have breaks to keep people with you. Because if you just talk or just read, people will fade out and they'll start thinking about what they're doing when they leave here. So I'm watching you in the back of the room. Can you see me? Let me see you. Wave your hands if you can see me, all right? Okay. I'm going to be thinking about you back there, all right? If you start fading, do like that, and I'll try something else. <laughs> I begin with a story. I was told one of the students said, say something that's personal. I begin with a story, and the story involves the book that I wrote that uh, I'm signing tonight, and it involves being asked the question, what happened in my childhood that led to my fundamental philosophy of education and to my passion for developing young people in science? scientists and engineers. And it is a fact that we are all the products of our childhood experiences. Whether we are 40 or 60 or 20, that much of what we do, the way we approach the world, comes as a result of experiences as children. And so I'm sitting in the back of church in the middle of the week in 1963, in May of 1963, not wanting to be there. What kid wants to be in church in the middle of the week? And I'm being placated with the two things I like best in the world. Math and food. I'm eating. I'm getting smarter and fatter all the time. And I'm eating M&M's, the good kind, the peanuts. You know those kind, right? 
and I'm eating and doing the math because my parents have forced me to come to this and listen to this guy talk, and somehow I hear him say, if the children participate in this peaceful protest, all of America will understand that even our babies, even our children know the difference between right and wrong. And I look up and I say, who is that guy? Because I'm thinking I'm so tired of getting these hand-me-down books from white schools. And I'm bothered that my parents can't buy my books because they're told if, you, if your child has new books, he'll be different from all the other kids who have these torn up books. He's got to have the same torn up books. And I'm tired of that. I'm tired of being told that the white schools are much better than our schools. And I want to understand what is it they're getting we're not getting. And this guy says that if we participate in this peaceful protest, America will help the little kids in Birmingham to get a better education. And all of a sudden, who is this guy? And of course his name was Dr. Martin King. And I go home and I say, I want to go, I want to march. And they look at me and say, absolutely not. <laughs> to which I respond quickly, you guys are hypocrites. Now at that time, students, you did not tell your parents they were hypocrites. All right, you did not do that. They immediately sent me to my room. I knew I was in trouble. They came in the next morning, they had not slept, and they said it was not that we didn't trust you. We knew that if you go and protest peacefully, you will go to jail. We don't trust the people who will be over you. I've often thought about that experience because I would not have let my son go. But they did, they said, we're gonna put you in God's hands, and if you want to go, you can. Now, my students have often said, you must have been a really brave kid. I was not a brave kid. Let me say that again. I was not a brave kid. The only thing I'd ever attacked was a mad problem, okay? If there was a fight, I was running the other way. You got it? Imagine a little chubby, nerdy, mad kid wanting to be a part of this movement. What is significant is this. What the experience taught me was that after a painful week in jail, where we were treated miserably with several things. Number one, no time to be a victim. Number two, that children, even at age 12, can be empowered to understand that they can have an impact on their own lives. That in the words of the world, that civil disobedience really can mean something. That if you think there's something wrong in one's society, one has the right in our great country to speak up and say something about it. And we had the opportunity to see the results of our experience in several ways. Most important, first of all, we were suspended from school. The principal was told you must put them in all the schools in Birmingham where kids had gone to jail. And for the faculty and for you, those of you who are going to be teachers, teachers were told that if their children went to jail, the teachers would be fired. So it took great courage for my parents to say they'd let me go. What is significant is this. We were fired, we were put out of school, but the principal did something that I'll never forget. And I want the students to hear this. Even when you have to do something that you don't want to do, that you think is wrong, but you have no choice, there are ways of doing it that can show the fundamental significance of your values. <coughs> to stand up for one's convictions. And then he used the format of the National Honor Society. I thought that's significant to say that tonight in this honors. If some of you remember from high school, when you have the honors, you have the student body there, and you call people to the stage because they're being honored for being the best in the school academically. Well, he used that format to call each of us to the stage. And then he gave the most inspiring few words that led to the entire student body literally giving us a standing ovation, and we all cried. We cried because we were so hurt that our city would think so little of us to kick us out of school. But we also cried because our principal believed in us, and so did those students. And what he did that was also significant was to have the teachers send the homework home by children so that we could continue to do our homework even for those days when we were out of school. The courts finally put us back in school and that summer there was another march and begin, begin, within a, a few months, we were in 1964, 
and there was legislation most of you would not want, but the civil rights legislation, the voting rights legislation, higher education legislation, all within two years, 64 and 65. This is this 50-year period from the early 60s to today. And here is the point. I was speaking to the School Board Association of Georgia and a wonderful CEO of a company said to me, when some people were uncomfortable hearing about civil rights, he said, it was mainly a white audience, he said, you know, I, I'd like to say something, Dr. Bowski. He said, you know, when you hear about civil rights and you hear about you're going to jail, you think, well, that helped, that helped black people, that helped women. Uh, he said, but here I stand, a wealthy white man, the CEO of a major company, and people assume I come from money. He said, nothing could be further from the truth. He said, my mother was a sharecropper because my father was dead. And my mother saw the little Negro children going off to college after the Higher Education Act in 65, which gave financial aid to people who didn't have money. And she said, I want my children to go to college too. First time she'd ever thought it. And because my sister and I went to college, he said, I got a good job and I moved up and now I'm the CEO of this company. He said, so when Americans hear about the Civil Rights Movement, they should never think that that movement, those laws, only helped one group. He said, that movement helped all of America. And I'm going to ask you right now, give that movement a round of applause for what it did for our whole country. significant that period was, particularly just thinking about the Higher Education Act. Here's a question, because the eight minutes are open, I want to make sure you don't leave me, all right? All right? I'm watching you in the back. You with me still? Back there? Okay. Here it is. Listen to this. What percent of Americans do you think had graduated from college, 25 years and older, in 1965? Take a guess. What would you think? What'd you say? I heard somebody say 10. Somebody else? 5, 15. 15, 5. Anybody else? 20. Surprisingly, it is, it's 10%. At that time, we only talked about people in two groups, black and white, okay? What percent of whites had a college degree? Now, don't let me leave here saying you're risk adverse, right? Okay. Teachers must be able to take risk, right? 20% anybody else? 24. 24 anybody else? 15. In the back? 30. It was only 11%. <laughs> only 11% of whites in, in the early 60s up to 65, over the age of 25 had a degree. What percent of blacks? Don't be embarrassed, go ahead and say it. One. 2%. Okay, all right. Now, today we have all kinds of groups we talk about. What percent of Americans have a college degree? 50. Somebody said 50%, anybody else? 33, anybody else? 60, anybody else? It's actually only 30%. Only 30%. Now, what percent of whites? 45. 45, anybody else? 50. 60, it's only 37%. What percent of blacks? 13. It's almost 20%. What's the fastest growing group in our country? Latinos, Hispanics, right? What percent? Three. It's 15%. Okay. Okay, what do you think the Asian population is? 45. 40. 20. 30. It's 55%. Because large numbers, my, my campus has students from 150 countries, and about 25% are from Asian countries, most of whom have parents who came here to go to college. You'll find large numbers of students of your age whose parents came here to go to college, and they remain. So they are the, by far the best educated in our country. Those are the Asian, certain groups, Chinese, Indian, there are other groups that are not with that level of advantage, but certain groups are well educated. Now, listen to this. So you put it all together, and this is what I can tell you. Two-thirds of Americans today 
over the age of 25 have not graduated from college. Now, when I talk to my friends, educated people of all races, they will say, Freeman, that couldn't be true. Everybody I know has a college degree. Duh. Duh. College professors, no college professors. Lawyers, no lawyers. Teachers, no teachers. Principals, no principals. Physicians, no physicians. And plumbers who make more money than any of y'all, no plumbers. All right? Okay? The point is that most people today don't have a college degree, but the significance of that act, of all those acts, Civil Rights Act, Higher Education, all those acts, is that literally, if you think about it, we've gone from 10% to 30%, so we've tripled, we tripled the percentage of Americans with a degree. This is really important for whether you're going to be a teacher or in education broadly as you think about how we fit in the world. Now, here's, here's an interesting point. How many of you are between the ages of 35 and 70 years old? I've got good news and bad. Which one do you want first? Bad news first. Bad news is getting kind of old. It's okay to get old. I'm over 60. It's okay. It's okay. It beats the alternative, right? The good news is if you are an American and you're between 35 and 70, you are the best educated in the world with the exception of Norway. We are known to be the best, and we have been the example for the world in education. Now, I'm sure I have some grad students there, is that right? How many of you are between 25 and 34? They're very proud, you notice? They're very, very proud, all right? Because they're saying they're not old like the rest of us, okay? <laughs> now, colleagues, watch this. Um, bad news or good first? I'll give you the bad first. <laughs> Bad news is you're not as smart as we are. I hate to tell you, right? <laughs> while we're number two, and I'm using this jokingly, but while we're number two, you all are number 12 in the world. Americans between the ages of 25 and 34, and that's because the students in here are probably between 18 and 22, 23, right? So you're going to be in their category very shortly. And I'm telling you the, uh, that the students who are like 25 or so, and here's the problem. They're number 12 in the world for this reason. Students go to college, but in America, they're not graduating. In other countries, they go to college and they graduate. So the other countries have been inspired by America to get more people into college and they graduate. In our country, only about half graduate. And the biggest issue, even more than money, has to do with academic skills. Academic skills. Because if you're from the lowest income backgrounds, you can get the federal money. The problem with financial aid is for working class people with, who are not able to get Pell Grants. It's that working class, middle class family that has a challenge that we have to work on in our society. I share that Obama Commission looking at some of those issues. And what I will tell you is that the, the challenge for people from the lowest background is that they don't fill out the forms by the deadline. If you are in a school, if you are working as a student teacher, or if you're a teacher, the real challenge is that there are deadlines for getting money from the federal government. But if you're from a low-income background and you're not accustomed to meeting deadlines, you miss the deadline, you miss the money. And that is the issue. It's a critical challenge in our country. And the question that you want to ask yourself is, OK, why is it that so many people beyond money don't succeed? And this is my second story. It has to do with my teachers in the room, those who are thinking about it, but for all of you. Here is the point. By the way, I didn't give you your good news. The good news is we are so jealous, we wish we were your age, okay? <laughs> Believe me, so feel good about being young, okay? Enjoy. So here is the point. My mother grew up in a small town outside of, Birmingham, out of Montgomery, and as a child, she had to work as a child maid. She had a choice of working in a hot cotton field or working as a child maid. And she wanted to see how wealthy people lived. And what she did that was fascinating was to go into the library and begin reading from some of the books. And the woman was intrigued and said, Maggie, when you finish your work, take a book home. And as you read it, let's talk about it. And then take time, write a few paragraphs, and let me look at what you write. And so she and my mother developed, this wealthy white woman and my mother developed a wonderful relationship. And all of a sudden, my mother's friends became very upset. Because they said, Maggie, come on outside and play. And she would say, no, I want to keep reading this book. And they would say, why would you want to read this book when you can be outside playing? This is not school time. And all of a sudden, she began to see the growing difference between herself 
and her girlfriends. This is critical for anybody who's going to be a teacher. She said the more she read, the better a reader she became. And the more proficient a reader she became, the more she enjoyed the experience. And the more she enjoyed reading, the more reading she did. She said the problem with her girlfriends was that they never read enough to begin to enjoy it. And when they had to read something, they read a part of it, she see them moving their lips and frowning, then they push it aside, and what do people say? That's not interesting. Well, nothing is interesting when it's painful. And she knew then exactly what she wanted to do for the rest of her life. The work she considered more noble than any other to become a teacher. And she wanted to become a teacher of literature, of language and literature. Because what she could see was the more she read, the more she understood about her own circumstances as a poor little girl of color in the 30s, at a time when there was no TV, the more she could express herself with clarity in her writing, the more she could talk with confidence and have a sense of self, the more she could read biographies and compare herself to other people. And she kept thinking, I want other people to get into this world, to see what I see. And so she began to dream. One of her favorite authors was Zora Neale Hurston, who wrote a book entitled, Their Eyes Were Watching God. And the book begins, ships at a distance have every man's wish on board. For some, they come in with the tide. For others, they sail forever on the horizon, never out of sight, never landing, until the watcher turns his head away in resignation, his dreams mocked to death by time. That is the life of men, and my mother would say, and women. <laughs> and the point that Hurston was making, the point that my mother was making, is that there are two groups of people in our society. People like you, people who've seen some dreams fulfilled already. Obviously the professors in the room, but every student in here is destined one day to lead. Young people, you are the privileged in our society. Even regardless of what your family background, the fact that you had the ability to read, to be able to come here, to aspire to be a teacher or to go into business or whatever you're going to do, to do well in your coursework, to develop the academic skills you need, all of those things say you're destined to be one of America's leaders. And my mother's point was this. The difference between those whose dreams become reality, all of us, and those whose dreams are, in the words of Langston Hughes, forever deferred, education. Where would anybody in here be if he or she hadn't been fortunate to get some level of education. What makes the work of a teacher so noble is that so many children need the support from their families, but they also need the support from that person at school who can look into their eyes and let them know how special they are, who can excite them about reading, and it could teach them something about ideas and teaching them to think. You know, I will tell you, for those of you, anybody in early childhood, anybody in my early childhood teachers, let me tell you what's really significant. The more that we dive at the National Institutes of Health into learning and thinking, the more we realize how important age zero to five is in the development of a child's brain. That those first years are so fundamental, not only in language acquisition, but in the neurological development of the child, in the child's ability to think as you lay a foundation. Everything is layers upon layers. And in reading, as in, in music, as in math, language, layers of language that we have to develop. And the challenge is that for poor children, if we're not developing the vocabulary and they're not having those chances to think Critically, they're not developing the layers along the way. The biggest indictment of our society right now, as great as it is, as large as the numbers are for all races of people who are moving to the middle class, 
is this fact. In the 60s, the probability of someone in the bottom 40% in the socioeconomic status, the probability of somebody in the bottom part economically graduating from a four-year college was about, was under 10%. Today, it's still under 10%. Very different from some of the other industrialized nations. We have still not shown for any race that we are doing enough to support families and communities to make sure that children who come from the poorest of our society have a reasonable chance of succeeding. And beyond, beyond everything else, I'm saying to you with all the other factors in our campus, which is a middle class place outside of Baltimore, works with a lot of children with all kinds of challenges. And the biggest thing we're working to do is to help that child have a sense of self and to believe that he or she can be empowered to deal with some of those challenges, but, but most important, to give that child the ability to read and think. Because once a child learns to read and think, you can never take it from her. It is an asset that the child will always have which makes such a difference. Years after my mother had become an English teacher, something came out called the new math. Now, students wouldn't know it, but are there any professors who remember the new math? The new math, right? And everybody was worried about Russia and other countries, and we didn't have enough scientists, and we needed this new math. And the problem with the new math was that we in universities too often didn't respect the teachers in the schools enough. We thought we had all the answers at the university level. We went in telling teachers what to do and we frightened a lot of teachers. As opposed to saying teachers know children and their behavior. We may know some concepts, we ought to work as partners. Today I'm sure you're in Emporia, teachers, teacher educators get that. We are partners just to K through 12. We're not there just to tell them what to do. We learn from them, they learn from us. When you have a partnership, you can get much more trust going and it makes all the difference in the world. But for a while, we were not doing that. And the result is so obvious. Let me show it to you. I go all over the world looking at the difference between our society and others. Watch this. How many of you in this room love to read? Okay, now I want you to watch this. How many of you in this room love mathematics? This is a pretty nerdy group, about 35%. <laughs> My campus is a really nerdy group. I mean, a lot. And we have a lot of arts and manners, but you know, but this is not bad. This is better than most. Usually somebody will look at me and say, how can you put love and math in the same sentence, Dr. Kowski, right? <laughs> Americans are very comfortable. And I always say to women, do not tell your daughter that you don't like math. Because as soon as you tell your daughter that, and she has a problem in the class, what is she going to say? I'm like my mother, right? So people say, well, what should I say? I say, well, you can say, you didn't have the best math teacher. Math teachers love me for that one, right? <laughs> but here is a problem I see, and I want the professors to hear this, and I want you as teachers to hear this. One of our challenges that I see in our country that I talk about around the world is that in our country, we teach people they're either good in math and science or they're good in history and English. Now watch this. How many of you knew by the time you were in 11th grade, you were either a math science type or you are a history and English and arts type. Raise your hands. Look around the room. The majority of people, there are a few people who will say, yeah, I was good when I went to college, but most Americans, in one way or another, had gotten the message well before they got to college that they were to be that type or that type, as opposed to thinking, I may like this type more, but I could do either. And here, and here is the challenge. I would argue we must get away from the term he's smart and she's not smart, or she's smart and he's not smart. What does smart mean? You know, on my campus, we have a mascot who is the Chesapeake Bay Retriever, okay? And it's a, it's a stone, we have the dog, but we actually have a, a statue. And students, the tradition on my campus is you never take a final until you rub his nose. Now everybody laughs, but guess what? That's the shiniest nose in the country, all right? <laughs> everybody goes, in fact, when I've got a really good meeting I've got to go to, I rub that nose myself, okay? 
But the name of the dog is True Grit. True Grit. And we say that UMBC is the house of grit. And I get goosebumps with that concept. Because what I want Americans to think about is that it's not about somebody being born so much with some ability. It is about mindset, what Carol Dweck from Stanford calls mindset. It is about the notion that we can teach children and young people and ourselves that if you really want to learn something, you can. It may take you longer than somebody else to learn it, but you still can learn it. When I was studying competition in Japan 30 years ago in Tokyo, in Yokohama, you'd have two kinds of, of uh, kids. One kid would get it like this, the other kid took longer, but the Japanese mother would say, but they'll both get it. And she often would say, quite frankly, the one who takes longer will, will not forget it. She would say what my mother would say. My mother always said, yeah, he gets it like that, but he forgets it like that. We think that speed means that you're better necessarily, as opposed to thinking when you have to struggle to get something, sometimes you really never let it go. And so the concept of grit means hard work, perseverance, resilience, never, never, never giving up. And so I want you students to start thinking about letting your children know you can do this. Whether one kid gets it faster than another, the worst thing you can do is to send the message, oh, he's much better than she is. One may get one concept before another, and another may get another one. We have a term on our campus called the math gym. I was explaining this at the dinner, G-Y-M. So what we do is that we do a lot of course redesigning, trying different approaches, is when a student isn't doing well on a test or in a concept, the professor will give a prescription to the student and the prescription will say, these are the particular muscles, without using the word muscle, concept the student needs to work on, okay? The student goes to one of the student trainers in the math gym, and then that student trainer will work out this student on those particular skills, and they'll go over it for a week or so, and then the student gets tested on that. The student can improve the grade, but the idea is the same one you have when you're working out with your body. Then it's not, if you if you got a part of your body that's not what you want it to be, it doesn't have to be that way. You get my point? That you can change it by having a mindset with the grit to make all the difference in the world. And so I want you to think about resilience, because we all fall down sometimes, that often, quite frankly, in whether it's in math and science or in studying literature or in whatever the area, sometimes we learn much more from failure than we do from success. The programs that we have on our campus will sometimes encourage students to take the risks so they can learn more without punishing them when they don't necessarily succeed. The question is, how do you learn from getting knocked down? How do you get back up? How do you keep going and going and going? Here's the other question to all of you. How many of you in the room, students, would say you work as hard as you could possibly work in your work at the university? How many of you can tell you really work really hard? So professors, why don't you look around? I see about 5%. Now I'm going to give you a challenge. You're all able to do whatever you want to do. One of the reasons my students work so hard is the students from other countries. You know, I had a student from the Baltimore, Washington card who said, Doc, I don't want to stay in this room because my roommate's from another country and she looks at me kind of strangely. I said, what do you mean she looks at you strangely? She just got this strange look. I said, did it ever occur to you that she thinks you look at her strangely too? And she said, okay, I'll stay one semester. And then we were having a focus group afterwards and they both came to the focus groups and they said, we want to thank you for encouraging us to stay in your same room. Uh, my American student said, I figured out why this girl bothered me so much. She said, when I would go to bed at night, she would still be at her desk study. When I woke up the next morning, she was already at her bed, at her desk studying. I never saw her sleep the first half of the semester, and it bothered me a lot. She said, I used to sometimes want to go and just pull it off that desk and make her go to bed, wait a minute. And then I figured, since I couldn't do it that way, I wasn't going to bed until she goes to bed. And so she said, I'd be sitting at my desk doing like this, right? and learning to eat mints and drink water and work harder. 
She said, and then sometimes I figured out maybe we could study together. So we started studying together, and she pushed me. And what she taught me was that I never knew how hard human beings could work. And I never knew how much more you can get when you work in groups, not just trying to work against people, but work together. And now we got a thing going. And we both pushed each other the same way. She said, and I'll never be the same. And so I want you to think about this question. The way you perform now, the way you study now, the, the extent to which you support other people, the extent to which you get involved in community service. I'm so impressed with the idea of the Honors College having the civic engagement, which is what we do, and the reflection and learning about people less fortunate than you are. The habits of mind that you develop now will shape who you will be 20 years from now. I'm going to end because I want to have time for questions. I'm going to end with a story. You know, I could tell you many stories about my students, but I'm going to end with a story about my mother because we all go back to those childhood experiences. Some years ago, my wife and I had brought my mother to Baltimore from Birmingham because we realized that she had developed dementia and she was such a, a talented woman that she was able to hide it from us in so many ways. And she was at our home, and one day she said to me, and she didn't know who I was, it was really painful to see that your mother, I'm an only child, it's really painful when you realize your mother really doesn't know who you are. She knew I was familiar, and she said, you know, I know the end is near. You don't want to hear your parents say that. Ugh. And I said, well, what's important to you now? Because when somebody knows they don't have a lot of time to live, you get the essence of the person. Whatever it is they think has been important in their lives. And she looked at me with the sweetest smile and she said, what's important? She said, relationships. And I was trying to hold it together and she said, my relationship with my God. She said, you hold on to your faith, you'll be okay. She knew I was trying not to cry. Then she said, my relationship with my husband, he's a wonderful man. She'd forgotten my father had died years before. And then she shocked me. She looked me right in my face, students, and she said, you know, I have a son. I thought she was about to tell me she had a kid when she was a teenager. I, all of my anger turned to, I mean, all of my grief turned to anger. I'm thinking TMI, too much information. If I didn't know I had a brother at that point, I did not want a brother, all right? It's like she's going to dump this in my life, this mess, and die? Uh-uh. It's like the movements, right? I'm looking at her really evil like, right? And she says really sweet that he's a college president. Thank God she was talking about me. I forgot she didn't know who I was, right? But then she gave me the gift that I give to every person in the room. Because whether you're going to be a teacher or a leader of any kind, you will always be influencing people. She said this. She said, I now understand that teachers touch eternity through their students. Teachers touch eternity through their students. Whatever I had to give, my sense of right and wrong, my lust for learning, my belief in those children, I will always live through them because they are the essence of my life. I went back to Birmingham to speak after she had died, and all these teachers came and said, you know, your mother taught me to love to read. And your mother went into the projects and told my grandmother, let your granddaughter go to college and become an independent, educated woman, and then she can do all things. And because of your mother, teacher, I am able to move my mama, my grandma out of poverty, and we are now living a very different life. Teachers make such a difference, as will each of you. I challenge you, Emporia, to watch your thoughts. They become your words. Watch your words. They become your actions. Watch your actions. They become your habits. Watch your habits. They become your character. I tell my students, your character has everything to do with who you are, not only when people can see you, but what will you do when your mother's not there? Ah, so thoughts become words. Words become actions. Actions become habits. Habits become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. Dreams and values. This is a special community, and you can be even better.
Thank you all. questions, comments and questions, and if somebody can give me some water. So, yeah, good. And this, I can see you now because with that light, I couldn't see your faces. I kept trying to do like that. People were nice to keep waving to me in the back. Yeah. All right, good. I can see your faces now. The, uh, no, no, I think you have a great question. And I, if you have not looked at Jobs for the Future, it is a, an amazing national organization that looks at, at post-secondary opportunities for students. And it says, yes, for some students, four-year degrees. For others, two-year degrees. For others, all kinds of programs. We need opportunities for students. Everybody does not want to go to college for a traditional degree. And I've had to work with a lot of families on that. It, it, it does not make sense for a student who does not want to be in college in a traditional program to do it because they're not getting anything out of it, okay? Better to let that student do something constructive that's post-secondary first. And amazingly, many students will eventually decide on the kind of experience we want them to have. So no, I would suggest, and other countries give students many more options than we do. We have a cookie cutter approach. And because some of the students don't want it, they come because their parents make them. They don't do well, they flunk out, they have all kinds of debt, and they, they can't get a job. We need to make sure people have meaningful experiences. And then just one other point, my point about reading and math, because what I didn't say was my mother became a math teacher and she learned the importance for the teachers in the room of looking at connections between language skills and math. If you give me a child who can read well, I can teach her to solve word problems, okay? There's a connection, whether it's chemistry or physics or engineering, we don't discuss problems in numbers, we discuss problems in words. And when, accounting, the same thing. So the better one can read and think, the more easily we can teach them to solve problems. Now why am I telling you that? When I've taken inner city kids over to the community college to learn auto mechanics, and they love cars, if they can't read, they still can't even do that. Because even the two year programs require those same basic skills. You get my point? So they've got to still have those skills, even if they do something else. Great question. Hi, thank you so much. Hi, um, I'm a middle school math educa um, education major. Yeah. Yeah, that's my advisor uh, and my <laughs> teacher right there. And so I just have a question about mathematics. And my question is, how do you get a student um, interact with math when they already maybe had a negative experience in mathematics? I feel like I tutor and I always have that issue. Any advice for me? It's great. I mean, she's saying, how do you get them involved in the math when they've had a negative experience already? Because unfortunately, somebody has looked at them and made the suggestion with a look that they can't do it. And unfortunately also, when the kid's behavior is not desirable, whether we know it or not, we send a message to the kid. And so the kid feels undesired in one way or the other. And you never know what the family, you want to help that child have some kind of positive experience. And it, it might involve a much easier problem. You have to start with some level of success. And it helps if you can use a problem related to something the kid likes. One of my middle school math teachers, my graduates, brings kids back from the inner city. Remember, my campus is out in the suburbs, out on hundreds of acres. But I have a lot of fact of students who are all racist. My white kids will go get the little black kid, bring him to campus to the basketball game. And we'll do math problems involving basketball in the court length and width and word problems. We'll make up word problems, okay? 
It's amazing if you can if you can develop a problem or two related to something the child likes that's within the reach of the child. So the child has success. Success breeds success. It's when the gap is too wide between what you're expecting what the child can do that the child becomes hopeless. Very important to let the child have some success. Okay, very important. You're right, I love it. I love that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you've been talking um, about the importance of getting a, a degree or going to college uh, tonight, and I just had a question. What do you think about the importance of pursuing a goal that wouldn't necessarily require a degree? Like, if, like we have these important figures in history that didn't finish college, like Steve Jobs and you know this great man that had an important career right. in life, but not they, they didn't necessarily finish school. Right. Like, what are your thoughts about that? Like, well, you, and how does that like affect affects us as teachers and? Educators right. Well. I always say it's important to look at the exceptions to realize they are exceptions, first of all. You know, when people talk about entrepreneurs who didn't finish college, you're talking about the 100th of 1% who may have done something like that. Most people need some kind of training to get a good job. They just do, all right? It doesn't have to be a four-year degree initially. There are all kinds of certification programs that will get somebody a job, though, okay? Uh, what, what a number of people who have moved on without degrees have had is exposure to the technology world in one way or the other, in Silicon Valley or wherever, or in other places, exposure that led them to have certain experiences. I have large numbers of students, I was telling people, I have a thousand graduates right now, math majors and computer science majors who work for the National Security Agency. And I have large numbers of others who've been working there since they were 15. Now, they can get a job in math at NSA without a college degree, full-time job, because a lot of kids will do some of their best math in their early years. However, we do strongly encourage them to work part-time at NSA, and they have security clearances. They love telling me, can't tell you what I'm working on, I'd have to kill you. They love saying that, right? <laughs> to which I respond, yeah, I've been hearing that since before you were born, all right? But the, the fact is that, because for this reason, Right now, they're the hot item. But then I send over a kid who's got a PhD, and that kid's gonna be over that kid who doesn't have a degree. And they get upset. Well, I've been working here all these years. Yeah, but you don't have the credentials. Credentials finally do matter at certain levels. They really do. But certification programs exist for kids of all types, all kinds of certification, not just in technology, the other kinds of programs that students can have. And it depends on the child. But all of those programs will require, I'm going to go back to it, fundamental reading and thinking skills. And I'm saying that, and this is a bold, bold statement I'm making, I'm saying the bottom 40% of Americans have serious reading and thinking problems. Let me give you one math problem that's basic from the NAEP data. NAEP is the National Assessment of Education Progress Report. That's, the, that's America's uh, report card, okay? The 21-year-olds were given a um, $20 bill and a menu at a restaurant. And they were told to choose two items. Don't worry about tax. And obviously, every item costs less than $20. And let's just say one item costs $8 and one item costs $5. Okay? And the only question was, how much change should they get? Okay? $20. 8 plus 5, 13, obviously $7, right? I'm telling you, uh, almost 50% of whites and 60% of minorities got it wrong. 21 year olds in America. Now, there are two issues. One is, it's so sad they did, but you in this room are going, that's not possible. Because an 8 year old could get it. Why would they have gotten it wrong? I think it's because he couldn't read it. And they, went, they were, they were uh, intimidated by the reading. But literally half of Americans at age 21 have problems with it. Because they they're scared of word problems anyway. They don't, they don't know. If you talked it through to them, they could probably get it. But just the reading, you see what I'm saying? I'm saying those are the kinds of, and this is uh, 
these are the kind of fundamental challenges we have in America right now. Yeah, next question. Um, the, uh, hello. Um, this is a very important question for education here in Kansas. I'm a political science major, but um, th this is a very big issue right now. There has been <clears throat> like cuts to funding public education, including our own university and all the public schools, which is pretty dire. Yeah. Um, and it's going like, to affect um, our future generations. So what would be your advice to future educators how to deal with problems like this? Yeah. I think it's a great question, and it's a question for the country. Uh, I think that teachers have the opportunity, first of all, to teach children and to help their families become critical thinkers, to be able to assess what politicians say, what they promise, and what they do, and to understand the impact of their actions. Too often, people are impressed by glitz or by what people promise. But we have to teach Americans to look carefully, beyond any party, but just to look and say, well, what's important to us? If education is important to us, what is it we need in order to make sure that K-12 and higher ed are funded well so that our children can get an education and get a good job? And if there are actions that go against that, then the question is, as time goes on, how do we educate voters to say, this is not what we want? People have the right and the opportunity to change that. They really do. But it does take good thinking. It also takes understanding what we mean by the public good. That is, that sometimes you're working to make decisions that will help not only your own children, but children broadly. And that's what I mean by values. That what has made America so great is that the values have continued to evolve. Before the 60s, you couldn't have even had a room like this. You wouldn't have had as many women in college. You wouldn't have had people of color here. And you wouldn't have had anybody who is not from wealth, quite frankly, except for a few people. I mean, really, I mean, first generation college was very unusual. And it was because change was so different. What group do you think fought the Veterans Act? That was the Veterans Act. It was called the GI Bill. Some people were, are old enough that they, they know about their parents. The GI Bill in the 40s, okay? Who do you think fought the notion of the GI Bill? Today we'd say, who could fight veterans going to college? Well, a very important group in the 40s fought it vociferously. They were totally against it. What group do you think it was? <coughs> college presidents. College presidents, starting with the president of Harvard to the president of the University of Chicago, said, if you let those veterans into our colleges, our universities will become academic, quote, hobo jungles. That was the quote. Because they were accustomed to the wealthy going to college. And they thought regular people shouldn't go to college. Well, the veterans came in and showed they were more disciplined than any little rich kids. It did extremely well, moved their families to the middle class, helped the society, built the tax credit. You know, it was wonderful, millions. And it was because of the GI Bill and the success of that bill, even though they still, they did deny a lot of minorities, they really did, and they didn't have enough women, but it still got a start, okay, that, that led Congress to believe in 1965 regular people could go to college. Because before that, we'd never had it. What am I saying? I'm saying we are continuing to evolve as a society as we think about the public good. That the more people we educate, the larger the tax base, the more we can have the good life for all families. We're still an evolving society. We have to see it that way. And teachers, though, teachers play a big role in helping children to develop the critical thinking skills to understand that. Okay? Yes. Go right ahead. Um, earlier you were talking about the mindset that people have that causes students to think that they are, can only be good in certain subjects yes. versus other subjects. Yes. Um, my question is, uh, as a, uh, somebody who's going into secondary education, um, students have been long, uh, you know, rooted in those mindsets by the time they reach high school. Yes. So what uh, mechanisms or measures would you recommend implementing inside of the classroom as an educator to yes. kind of combat this? Yes. Well, you know what? I think an honest approach is, is always good. First of all, asking students, how many of you like this? How many of you like that? 
and then asking them why. I, the unexamined life, for my philosophers in the room, is not worth it. We need to examine our thinking, our values. We, the only way you change the way we think is to examine what we think, right? So being able to say to people, why, why is it that you think you're not good in that? What is it that led you to think that way? And let's just look at it, right? Getting people to think critically about why they view the world a certain way or why they think they're not good at something. And then having opportunities for them to grow and develop in those fields can make a big difference. That's not to say they're going on to get PhDs in that. It is to say they can be proficient. It is to say they can feel comfortable in living their lives with the kind of math that every student should know, that any educated person should know. You, you see, I'll give you one example. I chair the Marguerite Casey Foundation in Seattle, and we work with working class families. We were helping my own state, Alabama, my home state, with uh, something about education for a tax, increasing taxes uh, for education. It was a billion dollar deal, and it was a wonderful Republican governor who wanted to do it. And it was the lobbyists who were against raising taxes who scared the public by saying, oh, this is going to break you. This is going to lead you to bankruptcy. They were talking about a small percentage in a state where the taxes on the land are so small, the base was so small for my mathematicians, it would have been nothing. But people didn't understand that when the base is small, and you're talking about a small percentage of a small base, you're not talking about the money. You were talking about $100 or something for, their, for the poor kids. But they scared them so by using percentages and saying, this is going to really hurt your family. And the people were so uncomfortable with basic percentages, they voted against themselves. They allowed wealthy people to keep them from raising taxes to help one of the poorest states in the union when it comes to education. It was so sad, just because they didn't know basic percentages. You get my point when you talk about math and everybody should know? It's like when people say we had a 100% increase and everybody says that's wonderful, not knowing that if you don't know what the base is, you have no idea whether it makes any difference. When I, I mean, I had in my, to the faculty in the room, my physics department went from one faculty member to two. And somebody had written that we had a 100% increase. I got all these congratulatory notes from all over the country. Said, wow, great progress, 100% increase. One to two, right? I was too embarrassed to write them back and tell them. You do. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Yes. Um, my question would be is that how do you deal with people who don't want to be helped? Who don't want to be helped? Are you talking about at the student level, at the teacher? Which level are you talking about? Uh, just generally, people. You know, I, I honestly believe that the challenge is always to figure out how you crack the nut, whatever the nut is. Um, and if I talk about people, I'm using that as a, right? <laughs> I'm saying, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is when it seems that somebody doesn't want to be helped, that's about somebody either being insecure or not understanding the problem they're having, and it's just a more difficult problem. And sometimes it takes time to understand the person. The person's being defensive, for example. The person doesn't want to change because the person thinks everything is fine. Uh, and for, I mean, for at the university, for us to, to improve performance of minority students, I really had to show the data and look at best practices and get people to agree to use an experiment to see, quite frankly, um, what we could try and see if it would make a difference. And it was based on the data analysis and analytics that we convinced some people and we had allies. And I think that's what I would say. Even when you have people who are resistant to change, you find people who know them well. Because sometimes you can't do it, but somebody who knows the person well can get the person to begin just to open his or her mind. Anybody with time can be encouraged to think more broadly. It just takes time. Because it's about trust. You all know that, faculty and students, with your friends. The more you trust somebody, the more you'll listen and think about what they say, whether it's a child or a teacher, a professor or a student, or colleagues. It's all about trust. It really is. What are your thoughts? I'm sorry, Sam. What are your thoughts on uh, the internet teaching and degrees? Oh, um, several thoughts. I mean, there, there's several ways we could take that. My campus is doing a lot in course redesign, but that's more hybrid courses. We do a lot face-to-face -face and use of technology 
not only in STEM areas, but in teaching and writing and other so the use of technology in those areas. I think there are parts of the country and for older students uh, who are working where the idea in some areas where it may be okay for professionals, okay, um, and for people overseas. But a lot of the hype about some of the, the approaches, when you look at the outcomes, have not been very favorable. Very few people finish the courses. I am very concerned about for-profit institutions in our country. They are taking advantage, they, I can say this very straightforwardly, they have taken advantage of large numbers of, of, of poor people, working class people, who end up with a lot of debt and no degree, and even if they get a degree, not able to get a job, in many cases, it is a disgrace. I have said that publicly, nationally, and I think the country is more and more going to say, this is not acceptable. There have been books written on it, on inequality, how it's expanding inequality, and that's some of those degrees, quite frankly, about the quality issue of some of those. There are some examples of people who really focused on quality, so we can't say across the board it's not. There are some places, but it, it is an area that needs a lot of scrutiny, for sure. I do think that use of technology in coursework and in getting students more involved, K-12 at universities, can be very helpful. It's one of the things that's been very successful to use on my campus, in pockets, in pockets. And we keep evaluating. I think that should be the name of the game. How do you evaluate and have conversations about teaching and learning? Um, I will always believe there's something about the face-to-face -face that makes such a difference in touching the heart and the head. I do believe that too. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, it says that you were named by Obama to chair the newly created President's uh, Advisory Commission. Yes. It's, a, it's like a huge achievement. Can you share some of the experience uh -huh. or share one of your meaningful experiences that actually influenced you? Uh, yeah, I, you. Yeah, I, I start with what I said before. Well, everybody thought I would focus the attention on STEM achievement because the country is so far behind other countries in STEM achievement. The only reason we as a nation do as well as we do in infrastructure and STEM achievement, when you look at the numbers and percentages of scientists, uh, engineers, even in the, in the Baltimore, Washington corridor at the national agencies, is we get so many people come from other countries to grad school. That has helped us dramatically. If we didn't have that, we'd really be in trouble. The, uh, the data show that only 20% of blacks and 30% of whites and 40% of, of, of uh, Asians in America who start with a major in STEM actually graduate in STEM. The rest get really, uh, they leave it because typically they are wiped out. We call the first year of STEM in America weed out courses. So we have major problems in our country with those issues. Nevertheless, the, the, uh, we have spent a lot of time on what I started with earlier, early learning, early learning. I already, my wife had done a lot of work in her childhood years ago and I had learned a lot from her, but the fact is that most Americans don't understand how important age zero to five, how important those years are in the development of children. So we have put a lot in, and the president and others have put a lot in that. The National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health are putting more and more money into those years and into the science of teaching and learning and helping, and helping uh, teachers, uh, particularly professors, think about how we're gonna shape teacher ed programs in the future to, not, to look not just at the reading and math, but at the, the development of the whole child. There are many other skills for my, for my teacher educators in the room. It's not just the reading and the math, it's the whole child. Some old fashioned stuff that families did years ago that children are not getting right now executive order kinds of skills that kids have just not gotten it because of challenges in our families. And the need for teachers to understand more about that whole child. We're gonna to need to do more and more of that kind of work. The second point I would make is that we're working on looking at ways of connecting in more meaningful ways K-12 and universities. And that should mean even more funding for universities to work effectively with K-12. Not just in the preparation of teachers, but in having walls knocked down between the two more in creative ways. There's much more we can do and, and more we can learn from other countries. And we'll be doing more and more of that. And with the new president coming in, there should be more. I'm hoping. <laughs>
So, uh, so yeah, you just mentioned learning some from other countries. You've also talked a lot tonight about um, students maximizing their potential. Yes. Um, my question to you is, since um, a lot of American, like elementary, middle, and high schools, divide their classes up into like regular classes, and then they have like AP gifted classes, and then they have like remedial or special ed classes where typically people of lower income brackets or uh, or minorities are placed like automatically into those classes. Um, do you think um, do you think that the like people who are put into remedial courses um, in order to help them, do you think that actually tends to be helpful or does it actually tend to limit student potential as opposed to like students who are put into gifted programs and tend to have like higher graduation rates? What's your opinion on division of, of, of students into classes? Now, I think you raise a very good question and I think we are far from where we need to be right now. I think there are, there are some divisions that need, people need certain help. Let's, let's not fool ourselves. There are children who need particular help. Uh, we have found ways of integrating children with certain challenges into regular classrooms, and that's good too. But there's no doubt that we go overboard and we get to the point of thinking, here are the really high achievers, and that's the way it's going to be, and then the others. We don't have a way of encouraging and supporting kids in building their skills to be able to keep moving. It's almost as if it's in concrete. You're the gifted ones and you're not. And it's a mindset. And the experts would say that's really not the most in mind way. And because here's, here's the deal. If you're from an advantaged home and you, my mother had me reading Dostoevsky when I was in middle school. Whether I understood it or not. She punished me with characters like Rash Rash Kalnikov. <laughs> Must, I mean, I'd be embarrassed when people would say, who is she talking about? I'd say, I don't know, but I knew. Because she, <laughs> she had been drilling me and, and everybody from, from Richard Wright and Ralph Ellison to all the way over to Dostoevsky. So I was blessed to have a mother who's an English teacher. So I was supposed to be able to impress teachers. You get my point? And that's any well-educated family. So of course they're going to be in the gifted class. You get my point? You know, if a child doesn't come from that, how would the child be able to do certain things unless we have supplemental work, right? But if you send the message, well, you, you don't belong there. And you don't belong there as if, and you never will belong there. I've had kids, quite frankly, in my mouth program who were diagnosed as special ed because they speak slowly. And yet I, we worked with them in middle and high school and they had near perfect math SATs by the time we finished. And I've asked teachers, what do you think? I mean, he still speaks slowly, okay? But almost 780 math SAT. I mean, we, we make judgments sometimes based on very imprecise evaluations. That's not to say that there aren't legitimate reasons for people to be in certain categories. It's just the concrete way that it's done leads people. I think there's a lot of discussing and challenging and experimenting that needs to go on to help children to believe they can do, if they don't have lead poisoning and things like that, they can do more and more and more. They really can. It's about having encouragement from community, home, from college students. A lot of my college students help some of my poor children to move further than you could ever imagine. That's the one thing I would say to college students. If you really want to learn about yourself, work with a child, it's amazing what you can do to, to take that child from one category to another if the child hadn't been so damaged as to think, I'm just ordinary. There's the issue. That I want every child to believe, I can do this, I just have to work hard. I can do this. You get my point? So you, you raise a very good question, and we have not given a satisfactory answer in our country. Okay, uh, so I'm an English major, but I'm not an education. I, I don't, you know, I don't plan on being a teacher or anything. Uh -huh. But I do do a lot of reading, uh -huh. and so you gave a little example about uh, reading and comprehension with the uh, American report card. Yeah. Thing. And uh, so I've read a lot of government documents, and I read them like five and ten times, and I find that I am still confused at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess my question to you would be. How do you think teachers can help tailor information to the students that are that's like high on that gap 
And do you think that the gap should be so steep, so much, so far away? And are, you, are, you, are you talking about government forms or? Well, just just because reading, I guess, reading comprehension. No I, no, I think, again, people learn to do by doing. I think that we should be teaching children and all of us. We should all be reading a lot. I read books with my students all the time, all the time. Um, books of all types, uh, from 19th century British to Harlem Renaissance. And right now, I'm reading books in French with, with them. I'm learning French with some of my students, and they are loving correcting me. They really are. <laughs> they really are. But we're reading Mr. Proust, Mr. Sach, Mr. Fanon, and uh, layers of learning. It's just wonderful. I'm struggling. It's great. It's really great. And I think that's what we have to teach people. We have to teach people that the more challenging the reading, the more you have to really dive into it. If you're reading English, I will tell you, I have been reading T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland for decades, and I struggle still. And every time I read a part of it, I get another insight, and I say, wow, I didn't, I didn't begin to understand that before. And I purposely don't go to something that would explain it, because I'm enjoying being made to feel humble, if that makes sense. You get my point. You know? And we need to teach students, especially Americans, that the most fascinating problems, whether, whether it's about understanding a text or understanding a math problem or working on the academic achievement, yet, are things that require constant effort. They're not solved easily. You know? And that's a, part of, that's a part of our challenge in our country. We prefer immediate gratification as opposed to knowing you struggle. The question that the gentleman asked me about the categorizing of people in these categories, you know, I can understand a teacher needing an opportunity to work with different groups, bidding on certain things, you know, and I'm saying I don't have the honest, the easy answer. I do know when I work with kids and teachers sometimes, it's amazing how much teachers can, children can teach each other and learn, for example, and we've done a lot of that. We supervise 500 children, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Children from the lowest levels of our society, first time offenders, children of color, some poor white kids who are um, between the ages of eight and 15. And we, we have them on campus at night. And um, they're some of the highest achieving thinkers I have met. Now, some of the best math kids in that group are so good because they have had experience uh, at age 11 and 12, selling drugs. And we're teaching them to take a constructive way. This is on my upper middle class campus. And we have these kids. On the other hand, and some of you appreciate this, you may not like it, I have a young scholars program I've had 20 some years. My math professors in the room, uh, I'll get numbers of kids through the capital sequence before they're 13. My youngest freshman ever, nine, I got a lot of kids who are 10, 11, out of the center of talented youth. You know, and who are precocious, you know. And why do I do it? Because I want them to have emotional intelligence. Because a kid can be very high achieving, but if he that or she doesn't learn to work with other people, it's over. Think about what happens to kids if they don't know how to work with other people. So we get, I mean, we get a number of kids, I mean, literally dozens who will finish that first degree at 14, 15 years old. With, not just in the math, but with stuff in literature and philosophy. And even in their cases, they are working hard and struggling with the reading, for example. So I would say, in any case, whether it's one of my first-time offenders or some of these kids from the Center for Talented Youth at Hopkins who are on my campus, the idea is you learn to do by doing, and you keep working with them. The more they work on the difficult texts or the hard word problems, the better they get it. That's the issue. Um. A lot of times the way a child is raised at home affects how they uh, look at education. Yes. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions for how we could inform parents about this need to encourage their children to look for tough experiences? You know, I would sound really mercenary if I said, get my first two books. <laughs> but my first two books are just that for minority kids, but the books have been bought by white families as much. And you know what the lessons in those two books are? old-fashioned values. When I've, when I've interviewed all those families of kids who have educated half, families have educated half not, half of two parents, others with a grandmother and other people, 
The values were the ones from old that your professors would say, that's the way I was raised. Learning how to respect authority, hard work, teaching them you can't watch TV all night, taking the time to work on the work, telling them they've got to write it. They've, if they've made a mistake or whatever, not punishing them by beating them, right? But taking the time to let them learn from the mistake, having them take time to reflect on it, maybe write a paragraph and talk about it. Just old-fashioned approaches to teaching the child to respect authority, to respect discipline and hard work, to learn that notion that the more something you do, the better you get at it, okay? You know, and that it's important to listen to advice even if you choose, after listening carefully, to do something else. Uh, it sounds like a simple point, but it's such an important point. You know, the three worst words I can get in guys are the most, the, the, the biggest offenders on my campus. The worst three words, guys, all the college students, the three words are the worst in the world that lead towards damnation, all right? I got this. I got this. When you try to give them some advice, don't take four courses this semester in this way. I got this. I got this. You know, like they already, right? As opposed to saying, well, let me think about it. I got this, right? And so what we have, and similarly, at the high school at whatever level, if the kid, if you can just get a child to understand the importance of listening to parents and adults and thinking about what they say, but it also means Teaching parents, you can't just lecture your children, you can't just holler at them, right? And you've got to live the life, you can't just tell them something and do something else. The one that really kills parents that I talk about, this really gets parents. I mean, I get really nasty letters. I tell the kids, tell your parents you can't watch more than a half an hour of TV a night, and tell them if you're not watching it, they can't watch the Real Housewives of Atlanta. <laughs> I get letters from mothers saying, how dare you try to tell me what I do in my house? Wait a minute. And you know what I write back and say, well, I just mean if you love your child, maybe you don't. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'd rather have a parent angry at me, because let me be the enemy, then she'll do it though, right? <laughs> and guilty than just to be like apple pie, because it's true. You cannot tell your children not to watch TV if you sitting up there watching Real Housewives of Atlanta. You get my, <laughs> you know, and I always can use the fact that I'm old so I can get away with it, right? But I am saying it is important though, habits known. Very, you yeah, absolutely right, it's a great question. <laughs> so, so since Bush, we've really had like an increased emphasis on standardized testing. Is that something that you think creates a toxic environment in trying to help these individuals have an increased sense of like self-empowerment? And if so, like when we're trying, or teachers are trying to empower these students, uh, what is like standardized testing's role in that? Or is that something that we need to completely remove? It's a great question. And let me, let me just say to you that what probably gets me more eggs in my face, or people wanting to get eggs in my face, is that for years when I was a young guy, I wrote the math questions for the SAT. When I tell people that, they just get so angry at me. Because, <laughs> you know, when, when, especially when minority kids say, well, it, the test is not fair, it's culturally biased. And I say, well, I wrote the math questions and I think I'm black. I don't know why. That's why I, I think I am, you know. <laughs> Uh, the, the fact, you gotta put humor into this stuff. You really do. Yeah, because people get really angry at you. They really do. And, and so people will come to my campus and say, my daughter wants to be a physician. And she has all A's from her school, in some school. And she has a low test score. And she's been working hard all her life. And she has all A's, but a test score. A score may be three, four hundred below my minimum cutoff. And, and she was, they said, you cannot keep her out because she has all A's and uh, she wants to be a doctor and she likes people. And that's what I get, okay? And I will say no, uh, but the problem is that the rigor in the school is not at a level that's prepared her for the work. And I cannot come in and not do well. Got to get into a smaller place to build up her skills. That her test score tells me she doesn't read well. I can tell you that right now, and then they get upset, but I said, the test score does tell me that, okay? And the next, and then she said, but no, she wants to be a doctor, forget the reading, she knows science, she's gonna be just fine. I said, well, okay, well, let me say this. You're on the operating table, ma'am. 
And the doctor comes in and says, I like people like your daughter. And I got all A's. I can't pass the test, but I'm going to cut on you. <laughs> Are you going to let them do it? What is the point? Either you finally can show what you can do on the test, or you cannot. It's just that it's straight up. It really is, especially in a lot of areas. And um, it's not about teaching to the test, but it is true. You see, unlike in some school systems, in many places, you have no idea what an A or B mean, will mean. You have no idea when you say somebody's had Algebra 2. The Algebra 2 in many schools in America will be less difficult than pre-algebra in other schools. And to let children into an institution where the kids have gotten fives on A, B, and B, C calculus and put them in the same classroom, it would be cruel. It really would. You have to, we have to, and that's just not true for low-income kids. I'm saying, I just looked at the data, we're in the bottom quarter of industrialized nations on standardized tests in the world. So for even our best achievers, with the exception of a few school systems, we're not doing well. And it goes back to the level of rigor of the work. It just does. And the environment is no less toxic or more toxic than it's ever been. We have fundamental challenges of values. And in most homes in America, there's much more excitement about basketball and football than there is about reading. Just fact of every race, much more excitement about, and that's the difference between our country and some other countries where the kids are doing better. I see it. When I go to those places, they always want to know, why, why are they so excited about the ball? You know, they got that, right? Right? And people get angry at me, and I say, good. Maybe they'll get angry and go home and turn the damn TV off, all right? <laughs> and that, that's the issue, it really is. Now, that does not say the standard that says is the end all. No, I don't mean that. I am saying, unfortunately, for a lot of places, there's no choice. You have to have a way of knowing what the child knows. You don't know it from the grades in a lot of school systems. You just don't know it. And you do need to know writing skills, essays, and the test scores, it depends on the discipline as to whether somebody can jump. But in STEM areas, for example, there is no forgiving. A certain minimum level is needed, or there is no hope of a child. If you've done the analytics, a campus should know what the minimum level would be for a student to have any reasonable chance of making it. That's just the reality. So what is, it, what is the solution? You work with the children well before they get to the same year in high school to build the skills and to teach them to do well. We work with a lot of kids to get them ready for those tests. That's the answer, you get my point? You gotta work with them well before that seventh and eighth grade so they can do word problems. So they can have, you know, so, I mean, so I, I'll be working with these little kids who are first time offenders, we'll be doing word problems in there. They're on it. I'm telling you, they are as high as achieving as some of my sons are telling the youth kids. And when I say, you're really precocious, and the kid is go, well, what'd that mean, right? But all of a sudden, they get excited about knowing they can think. But then I'm saying, all of you are. You can all think. You just got to give it that effort. It's effort. It's the grit. Get the grit, the test will be fine. It really will be. Final question from anybody. Um, over here. Yes. Hi. Um, a lot of what you have said tonight has really resonated heavily with me tonight because I am a, a student that has a learning disability. And my mother was a teacher, and huh? my grandmother was a teacher, huh? and they both taught me what you have talked about tonight, the grit, yes. uh, that if I believe in myself, I can persevere, and I can yes. go do those things. However, um, the problem being an LD student was the feeling of being ostracized, mm -hmm. and feeling that they're not normal. My question is, how do we get students to not make that feel, like make other students feel ostracized? Yes. How do we, change that fundamental problem with education? It's an excellent question. I, I think this is where teacher education is very important. This is why I think the field has progressed in that we do work on strategies for working with teachers and prospective teachers in working to help children understand that people can have all kinds of differences and all kinds of strengths, quite frankly. 
And I mean, as on my campus with kids with all kinds of challenges, there are times when standardized tests, for example, just don't count because of certain disabilities, when they will not be able to perform to show you what they can do because of those, whether it's dyslexia or time thing, there are all kinds of exceptions that way. But also, that's where, going back to an earlier question, where there are opportunities to have the integration of students with particular disabilities can be very, very helpful to students to learn about the human condition we have said, and how students can tutor and work with each other and see some of those trends. I think that's where you have the robust conversations among teacher educators, among prospective teachers, as they work with children. And to get people to get beyond their own biases. Because we can have more biases than we realize sometimes in the way we look at a child when the child is different. And not admit it. Need to admit their own biases we have sometimes. Very important. I'm going to stop with one, I'm gonna give you a one quote from uh, Apollo Nair. When I told my student body, I told my students, because I have so many kids who, who speak Spanish and French and Russian, and my wife and I had read German in, in college, but Americans tend to study a language in order to uh, pass a test. They don't do it as others in Europe, for example, do to be able to speak and interact with people from other cultures. And um, so my wife and I were getting ready to celebrate an anniversary. We decided to give ourselves the gift of learning French language and culture. And when I told my students, they said, Doc, don't you think you're a little old to be learning another language? Which was all I needed. You get somebody upset and they can do anything, right? But it was great. And so uh, I wanted to do it by just looking at the broad brush. How do you go about learning a language? How many of you speak another language? Let me see. Very good. Excellent. I bet Spanish is the number one, though, right? So, je vais parler le français correctement. Après, je vais parler espagnol. I'll go to Spanish next. But, but Jacqueline, ma femme, Jacqueline et moi, nous avons passé du temps à Paris en août dernier pour notre anniversaire de mariage pour notre 45. Give my wife a hand for 45 years of marriage. Give her a hand for 45 years. And so, you studied the vocabulary, the tone, the plus que parfait, right? And mon professeur est un étudiant doctorant à UMBC. Il est un originaire de France, de nominé. So I'm studying. Nous parlons le français seulement tous les jours. All day, et plusieurs étudiants à UMBC parlent français, yeah, espagnol. Uh, and so all day long, students are texting me in French. So all day long, I'm studying. But what is my point? You learn to do by doing. They love correcting me, and I'm working on conjugations. And, uh, and the key is you never stop learning. There's the point. And the quote I give you is from the French poet Apollinaire. And he said this, La joie venait toujours après la peine. La joie venait toujours après Le Pen. And it means this, the joy comes after the struggle. My students say, but doc, all you're saying is no pain? No gas. No gas. Yeah, but I sound more romantic. Thank you all very much. Bye. <laughs>